Hello and welcome to the Ontario Science Center's live stream event. My name is Jordana, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm a host here at the Ontario Science Center. Welcome to everyone watching. We'd love to hear where you're tuning in from today. Um, the chat is open, so you can post there to say hi, and throughout our event today, you can also post any questions you have in the chat, and we'll do our best to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, I'd also like to welcome our special guest today, Brian Belfoy. Welcome, Brian. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. So wonderful. I have to tell you the truth, Jordana. I am a, I am a little hungry, so I have a little bit of snacks here. I hope you don't mind. I do not mind. <laughs> fantastic. So let's see where everyone is joining us from today. So I can see we have lots of classes from the TDSB. Um, we have students from grades three and four in Windsor at Princess Elizabeth Public School. We have a grade nine science class. We have a seven, eight gifted class from Scarborough, Ontario. Lots and lots of folks coming in today. Uh, we have an outdoor education class from the Mi'kmaq Nation in Quebec. That's wonderful. Welcome, everyone. Um, I would like to begin uh, by acknowledging the land where I am joining you from today. As you may have guessed, I am at the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto. The Science Centre sits on the lands and territories of many nations, including the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat Peoples, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This land is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Toronto is also covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. As a settler, I am grateful to be able to live and work on this land alongside Indigenous peoples who have cared for it since time immemorial. I know some of you are joining today from outside of Toronto, and I encourage you to learn about the peoples, treaties, and histories of the land where you live, work, and go to school. One resource that can be a helpful starting point here in Canada is the website whose.land. Another opportunity for us to learn and reflect is the upcoming National Day for Truth and Reconciliation on September 30th. This is a day for us to commemorate the history and ongoing trauma caused by residential schools. Taking the time to recognize and learn from past, uh, sorry, from the past is one of the ways we can begin to honor those who are lost and the survivors, families, and communities of those who continue to gr grieve. So by now, everyone has been back to school this fall for a few weeks. Uh, one of my favorite subjects is math. Um, and now I have a question for everyone tuning in today. What do you think of when you hear the word mathematics? So you can write your answers in the chat. So I love math because math kind of explains a lot of what we do in our day-to-day -day lives, right? Math is so involved in everything we do. And I think it's really interesting to see how math explains so much. So let's see what people have written in the chat about math. Ooh. Hang on. We have people saying that math is hard. We have people saying, I like numbers. <laughs> That's lots and lots. Uh, it's really great to hear from all of you. So as you may have guessed, today we are going to be talking about math, but in a way that may be new to some of us. Our live stream today is about traditional Indigenous mathematics. I am so pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Brian, who has some wonderful stories to share with us. So without further ado, I will pass it over to you, Brian. Thank you, miigwech. Ani kanawia, Brian Belfe, Indigenous cause, Nipsing First Nation, Don Jaba, Minwa, Mississauga, and Mississauga Traditional Territory, Don Jaba. So hello, everyone. My name is Brian Belfe, Mr. Bal, as a lot of the kids call me. I'm from Nipsing First Nation and Mississauga First Nation, and I now reside in Mississauga, traditional territory, in Blind River. So, my friends, today we're going to talk about some traditional Indigenous mathematics. Lovely. I'm so excited. So, who am I? I introduced a little bit about my name and where I'm from. Uh, I am a father of three lovely little kids, and so there's a picture of me. And I got my back with my little Zabet, uh, my big boy Leland, and my littlest boy, my middle child, uh, Theodore, or Teddy, 
as we like to call them. And then here's a picture of me as well with my little one, uh, Elizabeth or Zabet, as we like to call her. And so today I'm here to talk about indigenous mathematics. But what is indigenous mathematics? Well, my definition of traditional indigenous mathematics is math that indigenous people have used in traditional settings while doing traditional activities. So I had to come up with this a little bit on my own and I've changed it every now and then to fit what I wanted it to say. So I know that indigenous mathematics is not if three Anishinaabe people fit into a canoe and there's two full canoes paddling down a river. How many Anishinaabe people are there? Sure, the answer might be six. And sure, while using familiar terminology is great, and it's an entry point to talking about birch bark canoes and the natural highways that rivers are, simply having our knowledge as a placeholder in math does not quite count as the traditional mathematics I want to talk about. So that's why I like talking about traditional Indigenous mathematics. So this is where I give you an example of traditional mathematics. Um, and here we go into containers. Well, what does Mr. Bell mean by containers? Well, there's all sorts of containers out there in the world. In the slides, you can see I have a, uh, a tote, that the blue tote that uh, some people might put their toys in or store some old documents. And we see a grocery basket. Those are both containers. And we see that Mr. Bell has some snacks here. This is also a wonderful container. It holds my snacks really well. And it even has a handy lid. Keep my snacks good. So, but those are regular containers. I want to talk to you about indigenous math today. So let's talk about indigenous containers. Well, what makes a container indigenous? So here, I would like you to go into the chat and describe the difference between modern indigenous containers and traditional containers. We see here that there looks like there's some differences between them. This container, number four, is a glass bottle. Oh my goodness, it's quite different. So let's take out that glass bottle and let's look at the traditional indigenous containers, one that we've been using for thousands of years. So what are the differences between these containers? Well, I'm sure you can answer that in the chat. <gasps> How are they different from containers in your home, such as snacks, containers for snacks or containers for jam? What are the purposes of these containers? And which container would hold the most? Let me describe to you a little bit about these containers. Container number one is a basket made out of ash from an ash tree. So this basket's made from strips. And I want you to describe the difference between that one and basket number two that is also made from ash and is also made from strips. Now, basket number three is also different. It's made from a birch tree and it was made from larger strips when I, they were on the tree. But as you can see here, it looks a little different. So make sure you type into the chat answers to those four questions with the fourth question being, which container will hold the most? So, this one looks pretty small, maybe. Mm, these ones look like they could hold quite a bit. So make your comments and tell me what you think. A few other traditional indigenous containers that are quite known are quill boxes. So up here is a quill box. This quill box is made from porcupine quills and birch bark that have been dyed. It's so fantastic that our people took the time when they made these to dye those quills and to put them down. That's pretty fantastic. And the other longer basket on the bottom right here, well, that one 
is a cedar bentwood box. Now, cedar bentwood boxes are kind of what it says. It's wood that was bent. So this one wasn't made from separate pieces to make the whole bottom of the container. It was made from one piece of wood spread out like a net. So they took the net of this box and they folded it and made a container. And when you make a container out of a nice folded piece of wood, it's going to be really waterproof. And so I really like that bentwood box. So let's see a quick demonstration of each of those containers we just looked at. So I'm going to share with you some of the containers I have with me today. So here we have, oh, I'll grab basket number one first. Here we have basket number one. Basket number one is that beautiful ash basket. I actually made this basket, my friends. And as you see, that piece of wood, I even bent around the corners and I placed it here. The process of making an ash tree takes a lot of work and a lot of labor and a lot of skill and knowledge. This ash basket, is fantastic as well. You see the strips are actually thinner, smaller strips. Kind of like when you play with Lego and your little sibling plays with Duplo. Well, Mr. Bell made the Duplo basket and some professionals named Irene made this nicer basket. So here are two examples. I have this smaller one that I made as well, but I don't need this one. So I'm just gonna give it a little a little toss, it's gonna to go away for now. So looking at these two baskets, we can really examine the differences of them. <gasps> this one has a beautiful lid. Now, I wonder which of these baskets will hold more. Here is my birch bark basket. As you can see, I've sealed the corners with a nice sticky dark material, just like Indigenous people do out in the wild. So there's my birch bark basket sitting here. These birch bark baskets are slightly easier to make. They, I shouldn't say slightly, they're much easier to make as they don't require the great labor of pounding out these ash strips out of an ash tree. All right, so my friends, here we go. I wanna know, Jordana, which of our friends thinks which container can hold the most? We have container number one, container number two, and container number three. So we have some people answering in. We have lots and lots who think that container number two will hold the most. And we also have some people who say that container number three will hold the most. Oh, fantastic. Okay, well, let's take a quick look. So. I have with me my snacks. Oh, I got so many snacks in here. I have some dried fruit and I have some nuts. And that's what my families would have done traditionally. We would have dried fruits and nuts. And let's take a look at these baskets. Well, I can put my dried fruits and nuts in this birch basket. It holds it pretty well, but it doesn't hold that much. Now, I can put my dried fruits and nuts in this basket, oh, it'll hold quite a bit of them. And it's holding them really well. Now this basket, if I put my dried fruits and nuts in them, and if I give it a little shake, you'll... I got some stuff falling out of my basket. I got a couple nuts falling out, little bits of fruit. I got a bit of a mess. Now, the reason that happens is because my friends, this is actually called a berry basket. This ash basket is actually meant for picking berries and there's purposeful holes on the bottom. The holes on the bottom of this basket are to let small bugs and leaves fall through, but not the berries. So when I'm collecting nuts and berries, it sounds like a lot of my friends might've been right. That basket number two was holding quite a bit of nuts and dried fruit.
But what happens if I take my basket, which is a container, I put a little paper towel under it. How much water do we think it'll hold? Well, let's take a look. Oh, I'm also a little thirsty. <laughs> so <gasps> the water went right through my basket. This basket is terrible at holding water. And now I just made a big mess. What a guy. <laughs> Let me dry it up. Oh, fantastic. Nice and dry workspace. <gasps> now, this basket, I wonder if it'll hold water. Wait a second. I already know there's holes in this basket. I know that this won't hold water very well. Now, let's try this basket. There's my paper towel. And let's pour our water. And let's take a look. Oh, well, there's no holes in the basket. And the paper towel looks pretty dry. Well, this is fantastic. It looks like this container holds the most water. So it sounds like to me that while that container, container number two, did hold the most dried fruit and nuts, it didn't hold the most water. So while we know some baskets are made for fruit and nuts, indigenous people also have baskets that are made for holding liquids. So this birch bark basket would have been used a lot for gathering maple sap from maple trees to help turn it into maple syrup. Fantastic. So, baskets or containers, my friends, are made differently to serve different purposes. Notice the ash basket has holes in it for filtering out bugs. It may not be an appropriate container for smaller objects. Other things may be appropriate, such as strawberries, they will not fall through the holes. The birch bark baskets are perfect for holding liquids, such as syrup. So that was a little bit about containers, my friends. So thanks for trying to think about and ranking which basket might hold the most. But now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about airflow. It's really windy up here in the Northeast today. And I had to put on an extra layer of jacket on top of my vest. And there was a lot of air. Oh my goodness. So I am always made to make sure that I bundle up to keep warm. So when we talk about airflow, what does that mean? Well, let's look at some teepees. This is a picture of a teepee from Nipissing First Nation, where I'm from. Let's go for a little tour of the inside of a teepee in a moment. Let's take a look. What shapes do we see when we look at this teepee? What things do we notice? Well, I notice that there's a lot of poles pointing out of the top. I notice that there's a hole and I notice that it's on a picture it's kind of shaped like a triangle. Now let's take a quick video of the inside of a teepee in case some of our friends have never been in a teepee. This is a teepee. Teepees were not used by all First Nations groups. They were used by many. A teepee is shaped like a cone. Teepees come in many sizes, and the interiors could have been used for different purposes, like sleeping, cooking, or ceremony. Traditionally, a teepee is made completely out of natural materials. The poles are made from trees. What is now the canvas could have been made out of many different plants, the leaves or bark, or animal skins, depending on the available resources of that area. There is one entrance to the teepee. On the inside, we see that the poles are exposed. You can tie things onto the poles and use them like shelving. Usually, there is not electricity available, unlike the outdoor outlet we see here in this teepee. Right, my friends. So. Teepees. Teepees are great shelters. 
and shelters are necessary to keep us healthy. They keep us dry, they keep us warm, and they can be made from 100% natural materials. The tough part is, so we got during cool nights in the fall and in the spring, small fires are made inside the teepee to keep the occupants warm. Appropriate airflow is needed because if we have a fire inside a teepee, well, there's going to be smoke in there as well. So we need to make sure that there's appropriate airflow, good airflow, to make sure that the smoke exits the top of the teepee to keep the people healthy. In the middle of the winter, we need a fire to run almost all the time. This becomes a little difficult in the winter because we need to ensure proper airflow for the fire, but also we need to be able to keep heat in the teepee. So we don't want too much cold air flowing into the teepee. So fires in a teepee. When you have a fire, the air around it becomes warm. It expands and this expanded air is lighter than the previous cooler air. Because it's lighter, it'll rise higher than the heavier air. And it will continue to rise as long as it's warmer than the cooler air beneath. This warm air will rise and force the smoke out of the teepee. That's great. Great airflow is important. Well, what's an example of bad airflow, Mr. Bell? Well, bad airflow is when the smoke, well, sorry, I'll give you an example here. The smoke only exits the teepee as long as the teepee has good airflow. Well, in the winter time, we want to keep warm and let air in so that the smoke can come out. But we don't want to let in a whole bunch of cold air. So too much cold air is bad airflow. And not enough new air is bad airflow because we need to push the smoke out. So how do First Nations people keep teepees warm while letting airflow still happen to let the smoke escape? So what did we do to let good airflow be warm and enter the teepee to push the smoke out? I want you to think about that and enter that into the chat. How do First Nations keep good airflow? And while you're typing it into the chat, I have a video about bad airflow. Actually, this one's about winter teepees, and then it's about bad airflow. How did we winterize the summer teepee? Well, we know there was a small fire inside. So how did we provide airflow that was needed that would push the smoke up and out of the top of the teepee. No, we didn't have a wood stove pipe. And how did we keep the floor of the teepee dry? We didn't have the teepee on a wooden deck. Also, how did they make a fire in the teepee on top of a wooden deck? Here we see a more accurate representation of a teepee in a little more of an accurate setting. Some questions that we still have are, how did we make sure that airflow is much better in this teepee? And how did we keep the floor dry? So, staying warm is essential in the winter time. A fire is absolutely needed. And we know that First Nations people did not have wood stoves in our teepees, nor did we build them on wooden decks. So how do we stay warm? The challenges that we have are that we need to retain heat and that we need airflow to push the smoke out. All right, Jordana, what are some thoughts from our viewers about staying warm in the wintertime? So, so we have, we have several, several guests, guests opinion. opinion. Um, so we, have we have one, one from Cassie that says, says a, little a little 
and, and Francis, Francis is, there's, there's a hole at the top, top and the hole at the top creates a vacuum. vacuum. So, so hot air rises, rises and cooler air is in. We have lots, lots and lots of lots of lots of Okay, so that's fantastic to hear, Jordana. Thank you. So I hear a lot of great thoughts about holes. Now, there is a hole on the top, but I'll let you know that hole on the top is not enough. We need more. So this is a picture. This is a diagram of airflow. I'm going to explain it, and then we're going to see the importance of more than just that top hole. So my friends... Here is our TP. This long orange line is the outside canvas of the TP. Okay. And inside the TP, we have short orange line here and here. Now, these short orange lines are touching the ground. And these long orange lines, there's a hole on the top and they're not touching the ground. So there's a little room for air to come in. And here I have my blue air coming in and it's going towards the fire. But notice the air has to squeeze between the layers of the walls. It has to squeeze between the big wall and the short wall. Well, our fire that's in the middle of this teepee, because it's always giving out heat, this wall of the teepee is pretty warm. So as air, this cold air outside comes inside, it warms up. It warms up and now it's inside the teepee. Fantastic. It's not ice cold anymore. It's not outside cold air. It's a little warmer, but it's not hot air. The hot air is above the teepee. I mean, above the fire. And this hot air from the fire goes straight up and out. So it starts as cold air. It warms up. It falls back down because it's not the hottest air. It's just warm. So it falls. And then it touches the fire. And it turns into hot air. And it goes straight up and out. Now... This is just a picture of it. Let's see this in action. Here's a video that I'm about to hit play on, and we're going to see the little smudge. It's going to have smoke. Let's watch the smoke inside the team. So you see here, we have our smudge in our TP, and notice how I'm not pushing down. It's not airtight. Well, we see a little bit of smoke trickling over the top, but not very much. If we were to lift this, we would actually see, lift it, you'll notice, quite a bit more air starts flowing. Because more air is coming through the bottom because I lifted it. Now there's room on the bottom. But once I lower it again, and if I put pressure with my hand to push it down and make sure it's airtight, notice the smoke comes, stops coming out altogether not coming out anymore still smoking but it's not coming out the top and again once I raise it once I raise it up a little bit and I make holes the smoke's coming out airtight is not good all right friends so now that we're done this present this demonstration we see that a teepee with no airflow, the people inside will have a bad time. The people stuck in the teepee where there's no new air coming in, they'll be full of hot air. Oh my goodness, and I never want to be accused of being full of hot air. So the solution here, which is shown in the video, is we need to bring the air in. So a little bit of warm air, a little bit of cold air, slowly warms up as it enters the teepee. So my friends, I want to say miigwech bzindawiek. Thank you for listening. There's my name, Brian Belfay, or Mr. Bell. Uh, there's my email and my Facebook. If any teachers wish to contact me in the future, if they have any questions. 
Thank you, Brian, for that amazing presentation. Um, I loved hearing about how the teepee was constructed to ensure that smoke escaped. And you know, the demonstration with the plastic bag and the smudge showed so clearly why there needed to be air flowing in from the bottom of the teepee. Um, the baskets you shared earlier were really cool too. Um, so now I can see we have so many questions from our viewers coming in. So for everyone watching, if you haven't already, remember that you could submit any questions in the chat and we'll do our best to get to as many of them as we can right now. So let's get started. Our first question is coming from Francis and Francis would like to know why teepees are made in a cone slash pyramid shape. Oh, that's a great question. So I myself am still young. I'm still a learner. So all the answers and knowledges about um, why a TP is made into a cone. I can talk about the benefits of having it as a cone, but I don't know why we made it as a cone in the very beginning. That's knowledge that is passed down um, and, and through our elders and through many knowledge keepers. And it was, um, it was engineered to be that way. We purposefully made it like that. Can you tell us a little bit of the benefits of having it as a cone shape? Okay, yeah, so some of the benefits of having it as a cone shape is that we can actually pick for the air to go out the top. Because if we made it into like a rectangle or a square, um, the smoke might go up into the corners and that's not really good. When it rains, you think a lot of roofs, a lot of houses have a pointed roof. So the rain could fall off the sides and the snow can fall off the sides. So that way, there's not a lot of weight pushing down on top of it. Interesting. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned rain, actually, because we do have another question coming in um, that says, if there's a hole at the top of the teepee, how do you make sure it keeps you dry? <gasps> Fantastic. So there is a hole at the top of the teepee. It's not a big hole, but there is a hole. Well, that's a great question. How does it keep us dry? Well, actually, on the outside of a teepee, on the outside, we have two extra poles. And those poles can actually control flaps that make the hole on the teepee smaller. And because we can make the hole that's on the top of a teepee smaller, we can reduce the amount of rain coming in. Thank you. That was a great question. That's very interesting. Thank you um, for that. We have another question from Amy, and she would like to know how long it takes to build a teepee. <gasps> That's a great question, Amy. Thank you so much. So how long does it take to make a teepee? Well, we need to figure out what materials do we use to make a teepee? Well, hmm, traditionally we used poles from trees. Now, these poles you have to go get from the bush. So we have to go to the bush and find 18 trees that are all the same length. So we have to go to the bush, chop down trees, remove the branches, remove the bark, and that's for the poles. We all need to get the right material for the canvas. So what did we use for canvas? Sometimes we used bark from different trees, and sometimes we used uh, different animal skins as well to make a nice leather outside for the teepee. So that is a great question. Thank you so much. So I didn't say how long though. I meant it takes a long time because we can't just go get leather from our local teepee store traditionally. So it took quite a while. I see. That makes a lot of sense actually. Um, we have another question kind of related to that from Brinley who's in grade three. And Brinley would like to know if the teepee is made of animal skin how does the snow not make it kind of sag or concave? Oh, great question. So because it's angled, the snow would mostly brush off, like fall downwards because of gravity down the sides of a TV. But also wind will help push a lot of that snow off of the TV. Ah, that makes sense. Well, I guess it's kind of like what you were talking about with the roof before, right? It kind of slides down and the skin is kind of strong enough to support it so it won't kind of collapse. Exactly. And we have to remember animal skin is leather and there's lots of durable things in this world made from leather. Right. Makes sense. 
Um, we'll take just a couple more questions. So we have a question from Nella, who is also in the third grade. And Nella would like to know if you can adjust the amount of air coming into the teepee and what if you get too much air coming in? That's a great question. So yes, you can adjust the amount of air coming in a teepee. So the outside of the teepee, we have a big canvas as we call it. And on the inside, we have that extra layer of canvas that doesn't let the air directly in, it has to go up the wall. Well, you can actually pull up the outside canvas on a TV, TP to make the holes bigger. In the summertime, you can remove that inner layer. So then there's no extra wall to let more air in. So it's kind of like forced air conditioning in your own home. In your own home, you can open a window, you can adjust the temperature. Indigenous people absolutely have been doing this for thousands of years. Our teepees were heated, were cooled, they stayed dried, and we had forced air in it. Very interesting. Thank you very much for that explanation. Um, we're going to do one final question, and it is from Avery in grade two. And this is a really important question, I think. Um, Avery would like to know, how do you keep the TP safe with a fire inside of it? Oh, that is an important question. Thank you, Avery. So Avery, fire is something that can be dangerous, but fire is also a very important tool. We cook food, it gives us warmth. Fire is so important. So when we made a teepee, we actually put a fire pit on the inside. We would dig a little hole where the fire would stay. Now, we didn't make a big fire because we weren't trying to burn off old brush in the bush. We made a small fire to keep us warm. And when that small fire kept us warm, we would make sure it's small. It's in a little fire hole right in the teepee, and it would be surrounded by rocks to um, make sure that the pieces didn't spread out either. That was a great question. Thank you so much, Avery. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you uh, for the questions and thank you, Brian. Um, those were so many wonderful questions. So thank you to our audience for submitting all of those questions. And again, thank you, Brian, for answering all of them. You know, I wish we had more time. If your question wasn't answered live, we will do our best to get to any questions left in the chat over the next few days. Um, I have one last question for Brian. You know, anybody who knows me knows that I love math. And I'm always trying to get people to see that math is really neat and that it's involved in almost everything that we do. And so I know we have a lot of students and young people tuning in today. And so my question is, what advice would you give someone who might be struggling with math or might think that math isn't really for them? Thank you for that question, Jordana. So young ones, if you don't think math is for you, well, math is a lot of things in this world. We use a lot of math when we're making baskets, not just when we're using them to figure out the volume of containers and which would hold more, but making each strip and designing the basket is important. And not just this basket, this container as well. When we make the label for a container, we need to know, well, this sticker is actually a rectangle when it's out on a piece of paper. How much room in my rectangle do I have for words, for a picture, and for things that I think suggest people should eat with their jam with? So math helps us make labels for jam jars. Math helps us pick the berries for our jam. Math is a great jam. <laughs> well, that was very inspiring. So thank you so much, Brian, uh, for taking the time to share with us today. It was so wonderful to learn and expand how we think about math. Um, and thank you also to everyone for tuning in. I hope you are feeling inspired to explore math in new ways in your classroom and at home. If you want to learn more about Brian's work, you can follow him on Facebook or send him an email at the address that we shared. And you can find information on our future live stream events, recordings of past live streams, including this one, and other great science content on our website, ontariosciencecenter.ca. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our social channels. I hope to see you again soon at another Ontario Science Centre event. Our next live stream is on Wednesday, October 6th. Bye for now.